Hello and welcome to the Climate Conscious Podcast. I'm your host, Derval Barzi. Today, I'm joined by Leslie Hostetler. Welcome to the podcast, Leslie. Thank you, Derval. A pleasure to be here on your podcast. Leslie Hofstetler is the CEO of Infinigen Renewables, a prominent renewable energy platform based in Puerto Rico and backed by Arclight Capital. Infinigen Renewables is dedicated to developing and operating utility-scale solar and commercial and industrial projects across Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, and North and Central America. With a passionate team focused on sustainable energy solutions, Infinigen Renewables is at the forefront of the renewable energy industry. So this is the Climate Conscious Podcast, where we talk about all things climate change and sustainability related from a Caribbean slash small island developing state perspective. Renewables are a major climate mitigation strategy for reducing greenhouse gas emissions to limit global temperature increase. The sustainable energy transition involves shifting our energy systems from being fossil fuel based, that is relying on oil, gas and coal, to alternative sources that do not contribute emissions of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So I'm very excited for us to learn more about your involvement, Leslie, in this critical sector and the impact you have been having as the CEO of Infinigen Renewables. So firstly, Leslie, what led you to become involved in the renewable energy sector? So back in 2009, um, uh, in, in Puerto Rico, there was a, a law that was enacted to in, incentivize the investment for um, renewable energy projects on the island. I think the island uh, was going through, at the time, uh, an incredibly high increase in the cost of energy. Um, that was obviously um, the result of of increased cost of of, of um, oil of the of petroleum. The Puerto Rico generation mix was at the time probably around eighty percent bunker fuel and 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 diesel. So um, our energy prices on the island were were dictated um, very much by by the market at the time. So. Um, I think the, the lawmakers at the time were looking for alternatives and also knowing that you know, we have an abundance of sunlight, we have an abundance of wind. It only made sense to start looking for alternatives to um, both help um, lower the cost of energy, number one, number two, and also reduce the emissions, the carbon emissions um, being um, um, you know, pretty much um thrown out into the air uh, and, and affecting the quality of the air here on the island. So seeing that opportunity at the time, I thought it would make a good uh, investment, um, seeing that there was a mandate to um, increase the amount of renewable energy generation on the island and saw that as an opportunity to um, begin a, a company or a business here on the island uh, to, to um, develop and build um, solar power plants. You essentially seized the opportunity. You saw the opportunity coming out of a, a crisis. And I know there's a saying that crisis and opportunity are the same symbol. <laughs> um, and it really yeah. depends on how you look at it. Um, I'm going to go a little bit further than that, though. I mean, what became basically uh, an opportunity and, and, and to invest in that opportunity became a passion. I really, you know... Um, when I did my research and I did the studying, I saw the impact of, you know, of, of fossil fuels uh, on, on impacting both the quality of the air and also how it contributes to climate change. Um, it really became uh, something I, I, I really believed in and, and saying, you know, this is not just a, a business opportunity. This is an opportunity to also 
um, help improve the quality of life of this and of future generations as well. So um, if, if you want to say I bought into that, I did. And this really became more than just a business opportunity. It became a calling for me. And, and I really, some, it's become something that I am um, infinitely passionate about. And, and, and I'm happy to take that message along to help others understand the importance of making that shift from, from what we've known traditionally to um, a fo- from fossil fuels to, to renewable energy. Um, I'm happy to take that message to, to everyone that I can. Yes, I love that from investment opportunity now to a passion and a calling. Renewable sits at the core of sustainability, supporting not just economies or business, but also people and the planet. And and that's what we want in every aspect of our society to really balance those priorities. Absolutely. And and community and community engagement is is a very important part of what we do. Um, and I would say from from even our associates, those that work in this in this company, you know, we we really make uh, a strong effort to 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 take the message to them that we really make a difference. Um, and, and especially now with the with the workforce that, you know, it's a younger generation. I think that they're very um, committed to wanting to make a difference, right? I think we all want to make a difference somehow. And this is a business that, and, and an industry that, that does that. It really gives you an opportunity uh, to make a difference, uh, no matter what you do, whether if you're in, a, in, in, in the accounting area, the finance, the operation side, what you do contributes to improving the quality of life of others. And, and so that's an easy um, uh, position to, to, you know, to give to, to the people that, that, that work here. Um, and they buy into that very well because they understand that what we do makes a difference and is important for the long term. Community engagement is another, um, important factor in that because we, we build solar, uh, facilities, but we don't just, you know, build them. We build them in places where people live, where people work. And they would much rather see a, a solar facility that doesn't um, contaminate the, the air. It doesn't make any, any uh, noises that would affect their quality of life. Um, and when we develop a project, we actually hire people from those communities to help, to help us um, to build them. We, hi- we hire, we, we recruit and hire um, workers to help build it. We hire from within the community to operate the plants and maintain them once we have built them. Um, so it's a very good uh, relationship that we build with the community, with the, the municipalities where we, where we um, uh, build and operate. And, and so it's, um, it's a very good relationship that we have. Think of it this way, that if we hire people from the communities, they, they take a sense of ownership of that, of that plant. And they're the ones that protect it. They're the ones that are that are that are there to help. Um, and so it's a very good. It, it works out for everybody. Yes, and it's a very important message to share that you can run a successful business while safeguarding the environment and supporting communities. We'll get a bit more into that shortly. But I want to talk a bit about some of the actual projects that you have implemented. I know that Infinigen operates in Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, North and Central yeah. America, developing utility scale solar projects. So can you share a bit about any of the key projects that you have implemented? Yeah, one of the one of the uh, most important ones or the largest one that we have is in actually in Puerto Rico. It's 57 megawatt uh um, facility that covers close to 200 acres of, of land. Um, and uh, it, at the time when we um, placed that facility in operation was in December of 2016. It was the largest um, solar facility in the Caribbean. Um, since then, there have been a couple other projects that have that have surpassed that. But I think it was a a a message that you know solar can be um, developed uh, 
at a large scale um, on islands. Um, so um, I would say that that's probably the most iconic project that we have here on the island. It was a, a very challenging project to build, but um, we're very happy with uh, with the way that that the project has uh, um, has performed. As you mentioned, this 57 megawatt project and 200 acres, you know, it raises the question that often comes up in terms of small islands and land availability, land usage. Um, what would you say to that in terms of maybe the competing interests for land when we're looking at developing large scale, utility scale solar projects? Yeah, that's a very that's a very good good point, uh, Derval. Um, so I think one of the most important points is you want to look at is when you're when we're we're evaluating places where to build uh, these facilities. Um, there are several points that we need to take into consideration. One of them is proximity to to where we connect um, to the grid. Right, you want to be as close as possible to a what you call a substation or a transmission center. Um, you want to look for land that is um, not. Um, environmentally um, compromised, meaning there's no wetlands. It's not a it's not a, a reserve that it's not prone to floods. That is in a, um, an area that you know you, you try to be as as you know far from a residential area. But the truth is that these projects integrate well, you know, within the communities that they are. Now, in the case of islands in particular, yes, there is there is there are. Um, certain challenges when when you're talking about uh, land that's available for agriculture, for example. Um, but I would say to this that that when you want to look for land that is not actively being cultivated, um, that's important because you don't want to displace agricultural activity um, to build to build your plant. Um, so our facilities, though, are built in a way that once they and their useful life, we return them back to their original um, um, state. So that land can be used again in the future for agricultural activity or any other type of activity for that matter. So if you compare a development of a solar facility with let's say a residential development or a commercial development, once that development's been been completed, that land is, is no longer available for any other use. In the case of solar, you can return the land to its original state and it can be used once again for agricultural activity. So I would say that that, that is the advantage of, say, a, a solar facility um, versus, say, a development of a, of a residential or commercial um, facility. So at Infinigen Renewables, you emphasize that sustainability is at the core of what you do. And we started to get into that when we touched on the importance of balancing the environmental and social aspects of your operations with economic priorities. So I'd love to hear from you more about how Infinigen Renewables ensures that its projects are environmentally and socially responsible. So one of the first things that I mentioned was that we want to make sure that land is not land that's protected. For example, wetlands are, are an important component of our ecosystem, of our environment. So we do not impact it, wetlands at all. Um, and and for us, it, it is important to, to try to maintain that land as um, pristine as possible. Um, to give you an example, um, what that the one facility that I mentioned, um, Oriana, is uh, on a section of land that's not flat. It's 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 it has some rolling hills. So we built it using maintaining the the natural contour of the land. So if you look at it from 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 a distance, it, it, it's almost like like a wave. That when you look at it, because we didn't we did not cut and fill that land to try to flatten it. We 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 just built the facility um, uh, maintaining that natural um, contour of, of the land. So I, I think if we try to destroy the, the land where we're building, I think we're kind of defeating a little bit what we're trying to 
uh, what, what our what our mandate is about, you know, being environmentally conscious and 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 uh, and maintaining, you know, uh, um, land as 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 it uh, as its original uh, state. Now, there's other activities that can be done. Also, um, we've been very active in researching and looking for options at how you can integrate agriculture with um, a solar operation. Um, and so we, we, we've called this, there's a, there's a, um, initiative here in Puerto Rico that's called, um, agroenergia, which is agro, agroenergy, where you can combine agricultural activity with, with, um, solar, uh, facilities. Now, the one that, that already exists and, and we're in the process today of developing a new, a new facility is sheep herding. So you can have uh, uh, sheep grazing on the land. It doesn't affect the sheep in any way. At the same time, they're helping you maintain the, the green areas from the, the grass from growing higher than the, than the height of the panels. So it's win-win. It's good for us. It's good for um, the sheep farmers. And because they, these sheep are also part of, uh, you know, it's an agricultural activity and, and they sell they sell their sheep once they mature. They sell them uh, for meat, so that is a, a positive agricultural activity that you that that is combined with uh, the production of energy. Another is we're doing some experiments to try to see what kind of um, of plants can grow and be cultivated in uh, underneath panels or around the panels uh, without uh, risking you know the the facility or putting anybody at risk either. So, so there's there's a lot of learning that we're in the process of going through, and what we've learned so far are things that we're going to start applying on on our future projects as well. Well, I'm happy to hear you speak on maintaining the integrity of land. We just celebrated World Environment Day, which focused on land restoration and conservation, and also. You mentioned integrating agricultural activity with solar facilities, and I think that this is an excellent initiative, and it addresses two key issues that are affecting the Caribbean, Mm -hmm. being energy security and food security. It sounds like it's a model that can be successfully replicated throughout the Caribbean. Yes, and and we're still learning. I mean, we're, 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 we're in a process. This is a very young industry. Uh, when you when you really look at it in, in, in general terms, and and I, and I think it's wonderful when you have the participation of you know other you know interested parties and and community involvement, because when when people raise that concern about you know it, are we compromising the in, the land availability for you know for food. Um, it, 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 you know, this is where we start thinking, you know, we don't just pass it off and say, well, I mean, it's easy to say, look, like we did a study in Puerto Rico and of all of the agricultural land available, that is not in use, you know, we're, we're, we're excluding that, that is being used. If we only, if, if all of the projects that, that are needed to, to meet the demand, the energy demand, if all of it was was built on agricultural land it would probably take up about 4% of the t- of the total available land that is not being currently cultivated that's a relatively low number but then again you know we are one of the larger islands in the caribbean we're not you know we're not we're not one of smaller islands so so it it doesn't necessarily apply to that but we could we could very easily say well you know it's it's a we think it's a small price to pay you know, thinking that we're not really putting at risk um, the supply of land vis-a-vis the the um, agricultural um, uh, the land the land that's available. Um, it still, you know, said okay, we need to put some thought into this, and and that's where we started coming with these experiments and doing some research in in collaboration with the University of Puerto Rico uh, to find uh, options and and to see the viability of not only the mix of agriculture with energy production, but also end of life cycles of the, of the equipment, because the equipment has a, has a pretty long life cycle. But at some point, you know, give you an example, one of our plants has 183,000 panels. 
you don't want to put 183,000 panels in a landfill once it's once it's uh, um, useful life has uh, has has finished. So so we are doing our research in what would be the most efficient uh, manner and cost effective manner in in recycling the the panels. So they they have a, um, a aluminum frames. Um, the the silicone um, spells are, are are made of sand. They can be recycled as well. So when you look at the components, a lot of the components that make up a, a solar facility can be recycled. So so it's not just how do you integrate the agriculture. It's also we have to think long term about how we do our our recycling once the useful life of the plant has has been um, depleted. Yes, thank you for delving into the end of use of the um, solar panels because that has been another key issue that comes up when we talk about renewables. Meanwhile, we're getting away from the carbon emissions. We also have to think about other environmental impacts which can come from waste at the end of life of the plant. What do we do with these panels? As you mentioned, what do we do with wind turbines? Um, So Mm -hmm. I'm happy to know that you're doing your research, you're thinking ahead and researching ways to make your operations circular which is is where we should be heading in terms of if you want to be sustainable and if you want to manage resources and especially on small islands with limited land space and already with pre-existing issues when it comes to waste management. Right. And 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 as a matter of fact, there's other other things that we're looking into as an industry, right? Uh and and I'm I'll speak as an industry, not uh is that also how do we Take advantage of, let's say, brown brownfields, and by brownfields I mean um, um, landfills that have been closed down, um, areas that have been contaminated. These are opportunities as well to build and and have uh, make use of land that otherwise would not be suitable for any other type of development. So. Um, you know, there are a lot of research and development is being done as well as uh, to identify opportunities to build facilities on um, what what are called brownfields that fields that have already been um, have had a, a, a certain use that are no longer um, used for any other type of, of uh, development. So as you mentioned, several issues that you have to factor in in your operations. But what would you say has been the biggest challenge that you face or have faced in developing renewable energy projects and how have you overcome it? Uh, the biggest challenge has been resistance. I think the fear of change. Um, I think when we all you know, um, are comfortable and, 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 and have something that works and, and you've seen that for generations, um, to suddenly, you know, having changes. I think it's our natural resistance to change that has been the largest um, uh, challenge. Um, I, I, I recall vividly my very first meeting at the at the local utility, where um, I was, you know, went in with my with a proposal to build a solar facility, and the first thing that I was told was, "Look, thank you for coming." Um, and, but the only reason we're having this meeting is because, you know, we, we have to do it. Um, this isn't something we like, uh, it's a problem for us and we're not going to do much to help you to develop it. That was, that was my first meeting. Um, and, and so imagine when you walk in with a lot of enthusiasm with a new project and the first thing you're told is we don't like this, we don't want it. Right. So, um, I think your natural reaction is to say, okay, thank you very much, turn around and walk away. But obviously that was not the case. And and so, you know, I think my my reply was along the lines of, look, I understand um, where you're coming from because, you know, but this is where this industry is going. This is where the future is. And the sooner you embrace it, you know, the, the, the easier it will be to transition from the fossil fuels to um to renewables now i understand i mean here's here's the biggest challenge of renewables is the fact that it's an intermittent generation we generate energy as long as there's some so we 
generate uh, when when it's daylight, and we generate on a on a clear day. When it's cloudy, the ge- we can still generate. It's not going to generate as much. And at night, we don't generate. So what this does is when you have, um, let's say, a cloud goes over, you're, you're generating full full capacity when the sun's really bright and it's, and it's a clear day. But all of a sudden, you have a cloud that goes over half of your plant. Then your production goes down in the same proportion. So and then the cloud goes away, then, then the production spikes up again. So that, that could be very uh, taxing on a, on a grid, on the system. It, in because you have you know amounts of energy that will go up and down so it could actually cause outages if if you're not regulating properly the amount of energy that's going in and out of the out of the out of the grid um so in in that sense their resistance was not unwarranted but but with any challenge you always want to look for a solution right I say, you know, I tell engineers all the time, you know, engineers are, are you know, by nature, you're problem solvers. So if this is what we have, this is the problem, what's the solution, right? So, so that's how I challenge people that, that, that always, they usually will always find a problem. I said, look, let's find a solution. What are our options here? We just can't say, okay, let's not do it. Um, so I think that, that a combination of both the resistance and the fact that I guess maybe by nature I am very persistent, um, uh, we were able to finally get uh, that first project uh, uh, on the ground. And, and so I think that anyone that's in this business and, and is, wants to grow, and it has to have two things, you know, persistence and patience. Oh, yes. Well, you know what they say, persistence pays off. But you definitely need to have patience to see the city people. Yeah, I, I learned. I learned at a very early age. I don't know, I, and and it was like never let the first no be the last no. If you know what I mean, because you know you can be said you can say ask for something and be told no, and and you and, and okay, but that no could be. For many reasons, right? It could be for rational reasons or it could be for irrational reasons. So, okay. So I usually, what I say is, okay, um, how so? I mean, no, why or how or what, 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 um, what is your, you know, your concern? Because usually the first no is out of, out of your, your first no, immediate reaction is going to be out of, um, of, you know, not knowing or, or not knowing the answer. It could be out of fear. It could be out of uncertainty. It could be out of many reasons, right? So then you start you start asking, okay, well, what is your concern, or why not? Right? And and I always say, you know, never tell a, a, a child because I said so. Give them a reason so that they can think and they can they can come up with with solutions or come up with ideas. Because if I if you're telling me what your concern is or why that that is a no, then I can have a, a a solution that maybe you didn't know or you didn't think about or you had no idea about and then all of a sudden when you start looking for you start um peeling away the concerns all of a sudden that no can become a yes and and that's something that i have i've learned uh, throughout my my life and my career that um, persistence is really uh will take you a, a long way absolutely and look, and at the end, it could be always a no, and you can maybe even yourself understand. Okay, now I understand why no, or why not. Um, but uh, a lot, most of the time, you can you can turn a no into a yes. And as you brought up the intermittency of solar energy, which is an important mm-hmm. point when we're talking about renewables, because as you said, you know the sun is out for a specific time, and there's also the issue of cloud cover. But there is a growing movement for the phase out of fossil fuels, also some support for maybe even a hundred percent renewables. Where do you stand on that? So I, th- I think that at, in the phase that we're in today, um, as an industry and and in, in general, 
you have what's called base generation. Base generation is that generation that runs for 24 seven. And that's where the, the, the natural gas comes in, the diesel, the coal, et cetera. And, and the advantage of that, it's that it's, it runs 24 seven and it's reliable. The disadvantage is cost and contamination. That's a high cost, high cost to your, to your, to your wallet and a high cost to the health of yourself, your family and of the planet, you know, because the, the, Climate change is real, and and we can sit here today and have many arguments about what causes um, climate change. But what is indisputable is the fact that the the burning of fossil fuels is accelerating the rate at which our planet is warming up. That's irrefutable, and and we can only if we think only as far as our generation, then we're doing a terrible disservice. To our to our uh, um, to our future generations, because you know they're the ones that 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 will suffer the consequences of the decisions that we make today. So what what are what why is it is to me base generation still important and necessary? Because it's what's going to transition us into the point where renewable energy becomes a reliable um, base generation where. It runs for 24 hours. How does that happen when you say, okay, there's only sun during a certain amount of hours and there, and, and, and this is where the importance of storage comes in and, and the use of batteries. Um, so when you're not generating, then while you're generating, you're also charging batteries. And then, and then once the sun goes down, then you can start discharging those batteries for a certain amount of time. Now the technology is at a point where you can charge batteries and you can get six about six good hours of uh, of energy coming coming out of those batteries. So either you can you can um, have a large bank of batteries where you where you um, spread out the time in which they they come in. And another is that as technology improves, so does the, the amount of time that these batteries are able to discharge. So that's why I'm saying that the transition, the base generation of LNG or 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 um, uh, any other form of generation, I would say LNG is probably the cleanest. It's still not the. It's not. It still does um, contaminate, but not as much. Um, I think that LNG is important until we are to a point where we can uh, provide reliable stable energy for 24 hours that is not um fossil based and what do you want on that because i i think ideally we know where we want to get to and maybe we're not moving toward that goal fast enough but it's important to recognize that it is a transition and it will take work it will take a process for us to get there but definitely but it's consistently it is growing consistently Mm -hmm. I think and that's what we need to look at. If we put into, if we look at it in the context of how much um, um, solar is being deployed uh, today, as opposed to five, ten years ago, you're seeing a steady, uh, consistent growth in the amount of solar projects that are being built and the amount that's being that's being produced. So um, I think we all want to want to see it happen, you know, as soon as possible. But these things take time, you know, um, that transition uh, uh, takes time while technology improves, while people embrace that, that, um, that change. Um, and I have no doubt it's going to happen. I mean, many countries have mandated um, that uh, 100% of energy generation uh, come from, fo- from, from renewable sources, right? And by 2050, that's 20, what, 22 years away, 21 years away, or 26 years away, I'm sorry. Um, that's one generation. We're a generation away from, from many countries reaching that goal. Now, is it an aggressive goal? Absolutely. But we have to set goals in order to, to, um, to move towards them. If we fall a little bit short, it's okay. It doesn't mean we're not going to do it. It just means it's going to take us a little longer. But uh, we can't 
not do it. We cannot afford not to do it just because someone says, well, it's impossible to do it in, in this amount of time. There's a general consensus that we have to do it. The issue is the the rate at which it's happening and mm-hmm. the impact of that, you know, the impact of whether there's a gradual transition or whether we reach a point where the warming is so bad that we have no other choice where we're forced to transition or forced to change without the luxury of right. transition and, and what the fallout or the implications of that would be economically and, and socially. But as you said, it's important that even that within our region, we are seeing some changes happening, especially since in the Caribbean, and I could speak more so for the CARICOM countries, mm-hmm. sustainable energy transition has been identified as a, a key priority from the standpoint of climate mitigation, but also for climate adaptation and resilience. As we expect or as we anticipate more intense and more frequent hurricanes, the transition to renewables will allow for greater resilience in terms of withstanding and recovering from natural disasters, for example, with microgrids. And Mm -hmm. it offers a solution for energy security by providing greater access, particularly in remote locations as well as the potential to lower the cost of energy in territories that have to import fossil fuels. So with that in mind, and from your experience in the region, how has the renewable energy landscape in the Caribbean changed over the years? And what do you think is needed to really accelerate the uptake of renewables across the region? You've brought a very good and important point, and it's it's about resiliency. Um, we live in a in a region that is um, susceptible to hurricanes. Every year, June first comes around, and it's the new hurricane season. And and it seems like we hear that every year is going to be a very um, active uh, year in in terms of hurricanes. And and what we've been all seeing in the past, uh, I would say, in the last ten years or so. Is that hurricanes are becoming a lot stronger along a lot sooner. So I think that by at a certain point when hurricanes are reaching the Caribbean region, they were maybe tropical storms or at worst carried category one. And, and then as they moved along the Caribbean and moved up, you know, to either to the Gulf of Mexico or the or the United States eastern seaboard, that's when they started becoming stronger between category two and category threes. So now we're seeing Hurricanes being category three, category four before they even arrive into the into the Caribbean region. So the the subject of resiliency is is is, is critical. Where we all used to depend on the public utility to power our 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 homes and our businesses, now we have we have the ability. We're empowered to be able to to generate our own um, energy through having a solar system in our homes and our businesses, which adds redundancy to, to, our, um, uh, to our energy sources. So you can, you can be connected to the utility and at the same time have your own solar system that in case of an outage, you still have the ability to, to, to generate energy. In case of a hurricane, you don't have to depend on the power to come back on in order to generate power for your home. So if you combine solar with battery system you could pretty much have power most of most of the day um so it's important that a well-built a well-designed and a well-built system um are able to withstand the um you know the 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 damages of of the damaging winds of of hurricanes so i i think in, in that sense that is that is making our quality of life a lot better you mentioned microgrids. Microgrids are important because because not only can you build a a solar facility next to a community where you can power an entire community uh, without depending on the utility. So um, even every single uh, I would say solar facility um, like a utility scale is a microgrid. So if Think that if you can connect a solar facility, a solar power plant, 
into the grid and grid and feed into the grid, you can also channel that energy into certain areas without necessarily being in, in, in the entire uh, grid. It can it can be limited to the community next to um, uh, surrounding communities to the to the power facility. So so these are the the, the benefits that you know that are also um, work in our favor that go beyond just saying, you know, we're, we're producing clean energy. Yeah. So are there any trends in the renewable energy market globally and originally that we should be paying close attention to? I think storage, um, energy storage is, is, is definitely something that is, that is gaining more acceptance. It's, be, it's more reliable. Um, it's become, it's safer. Uh, and and they're being and they're more more efficient and the price and the cost of them are, are, is coming down. So I see those are the trends that I'm seeing that if you by combining renewables with storage, you're you're being able you're able to produce uh, more energy during you know during the day, and that's where I see um, this uh, in the direction I see it going with uh, with the improvement. And of reliability of, uh, of of storage. I think it was really important that we had this conversation to really explore the role of renewables, especially in the Caribbean, the role that it continues to play in terms of not just climate mitigation, because we know this region is not responsible for a significant share of greenhouse gas emissions, but renewables offers us, you know, a fighting chance in terms of our resilience, in terms of maintaining the integrity of our environment, reducing environmental impacts, improving the quality of our air, and providing greater access to energy for our people. So that social dynamic. And I'm I was really happy to hear about the progressive nature of Infinigen in terms of ensuring that the social and environmental aspect of your operations are well managed and also research in ways to reduce your ecological footprint. You know, that is super important, ensuring that there is sustainability, not just is not just, you know, lip service, but you're truly integrating the principles of sustainability into your operations. We we all have our our role to play, and and if we think that just just one person by themselves can't make a difference, I would say you can, you can make a difference because if if you're changing the way you see do things, your neighbor and your family and your communities see things in a better, it will improve, it will get better. Change doesn't come easily. It's not like a light switch that you turn on and off and change it. It takes time, but it takes, um, uh, I would say, uh, will, you know, a collective will to say, okay, let's, let's, let's do this. I mean, 10 years ago, let me, let me, let me put this in perspective, Dervo. 10 years ago, this was not even a conversation. Very few people were talking about renewable energy. People were listening, you know, well, that's expensive. I don't understand how that works. And and so they they never would say I want to do this in my home. That was unthinkable to say I'm going to disconnect or I'm going to have in addition to my connection to utility a system that's going to provide energy. And look where we are now, where it's now it's a comfortable conversation that people say, yeah, it makes sense. I'm looking into it. I want to install it. It you know it's going to save me money at the end of the day. It'll end up paying for itself. And now the conversation used to be, I don't know anything about it. Then there was, you know, curiosity. And now it's almost become an acceptable um, uh, alternative uh, to produce your own, your own energy. So, and this is why it's important that this, we continue this conversation. So we help people to understand, help people to take the message and, and, and at least give them the opportunity to have access to information so that they can, you know, reach their own conclusions. Yeah, you know, it's funny that you mentioned 10 years ago, and it it got me thinking that 10 years ago, I was working at the state-owned oil and gas company, but I was also, at the same time, I was signing up to do an MBA that focused on sustainable energy management. Mm -hmm. And 
I remember telling someone what I was planning to do and they were asking me why, <laughs> you know, <laughs> why <laughs> something in sustainable energy renewables, what are you going to do with that? But to look back on the past 10 years and to see the progress that has been made, I mean, still a long ways to go, but... Oh, yeah, no doubt. There's a long ways to go. Things have been moving. You know, people are a lot more aware. They understand more about why it's important and how it can be done. And um, yeah, I'm happy just to be a part of that and Mm -hmm. to encourage others, as you have also done, to be part of the change, to not just accept the first no. And as you mentioned earlier, we have to be persistent and patient. Correct. That's it. And 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 I can only imagine, think about 10 years from now, I think this is going to have, it's going to be a different conversation than the one we're having today. I think it's going to be a generally acceptable alternative and, 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 and hopefully a general uh, accepted uh, mechanism of, of, uh, of generating energy without, you know, without contaminating. And then 10 years after that, it's going to be even better. So, you know, I think we all are tend to be impatient that once you have the idea and see that it works, you want everyone to do it and do it now. It's important. You have to do it. But change takes time. Um, and and certainly, um, I think we're doing a good job, though. Yes, I love your optimism. <laughs> 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 so as we conclude today's very interesting and enlightening conversation, as I ask all my guests, I'm asking you, Leslie, what would make the world a better place? What would make the world a better place? I, I would say, you know, um, give the opportunity to others to, you know, give their point of view of things. We open our minds. We open our world. You know, we open our hearts. And, 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 and we are not the owners of the absolute truth of everything. You know, others have different opinions. Others have different views. And and sometimes by listening we learn, and, and sometimes we what we learn is that you know we don't want to change our mind, or we learn that there may be something different. But I think I think you know intolerance is is one of the biggest um, destroyers of communities and, and and of people, and I think it's important that we all you know understand that we we all want to get ahead, we all want to take care of our families, we always want to be better. Uh, how we go about doing that, I think we all different have a different point of view or a different approach. But I think we all want the same thing. So you know, I think being able to listen to others and 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 accept what what you think can change and what you can't, then you know, just let it be. I think that'll make the world a little bit better place. We open our minds and we open our world. Absolutely. Um, Mm-hmm. I mean, I, w- I was for- I will say this. I was fortunate. I've been fortunate enough to since I was a child. I've had the opportunity to travel, and I've traveled the world. And in in my in my personal life, and in my in my professional life, and I have worked and 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 met and made friends with people all over the world. You know, from different cultures, different languages, different you know very different and, and and but still and and this is what i've learned what i what i said earlier that that everyone wants you know to provide and and be happy and 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 get ahead and provide with their for their families we all do we really do i mean we want to be better uh, and and if we you know get to meet and and listen to other people we, we realize we're not that different um it's just that you know, we, we have different uh, points of view and different cultures, but it doesn't make us I hate that people want to separate us and say this is good and this is evil or this is bad or this is, you know, we just see things differently. And, and the more tolerant and accepting you are, the happier you're going to be. So, Leslie, how can listeners connect with you and learn more about Infinite Gen Renewables? Uh, we have a page on LinkedIn. Um, and it is Infinigen Renewables. Think of infinite generation to, to kind of give you how to spell it. It's in infinite gen. Uh, and that's where the name comes from. So that's our that's what we aspire to do, to have 
you know, continuous generation through renewable sources. That's where the name Infinigen comes from. So we have we have a page on on LinkedIn. Uh, also, our website is Infinigen Renewables plural dot com. Um, you can learn a little bit about us and 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 about our company, and and, uh, and we happy be happy to to hear from you. Thank you, Leslie, for sharing your insights on the solar revolution. Would you consider the revolution still? <laughs> well, I, 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 it, it's just a shift in 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 in, in how we how we uh, how we live. Um, it, it, uh, I, I hate that the revolution kind of has other implications, right? As as it's a battle, it's a fight. I don't see it that way. I just see it as a it's an evolution more than a revolution. It's an, an, an evolution as we evolve from one way of doing things to a better way of doing things. I love that. So yes, thank you so much for enlightening us on the solar evolution. Also, thank you for your work in expanding renewables in the region and also supporting climate action. And I thank you for having uh, this podcast because this is how we get the message out. And, and you're doing, a ve- you have a very important role in providing a, a forum for, for us to, to take that information and share it with others. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Climate Conscious Podcast. We hope you found today's episode interesting, informative, and inspiring. Visit theclimateconscious.com for more info. I'm Derval Bazi, and this is the Climate Conscious Podcast.